Week Sustainable Japan. I'm Gigi Walsh, your host in Hiroshima, Japan. And today I have the pleasure of talking with Richard Pierce in Totori. Thank you so much for joining, Richard. Thank you very much for inviting me on. Um, it's been a while since we started talking about doing it. So finally, the day has arrived. Finally, yeah. it has arrived. And, and you are in a very interesting area of Japan that actually most people never visit. Uh, most people don't know much about. We had one other person in the talk show from Totori. Mm -hmm. um, but you are doing so many interesting things. Uh, mostly, it seems, around the Dyson area. Is that right? Mostly, yeah. I mean, um, in Dyson, I bought a uh, piece of land which came with uh, Akia, which we're renovating now. Uh, um, but where where you're talking to us from, right? Yeah, renovated. no, no, this one oh, no. is different. So this is a guest house, which is in a fishing village at the bottom of Mount Dyson. So I live halfway up, um, where the nearest neighbour lives, about a fifteen minute walk away, and so the chickens and the goats can make as much noise as they like, and not we won't get any complaints, or well, not yet anyway. Nice. Uh, originally yeah. you're from the UK, right? That's right. I'm from the Cotswolds in England. So I was a, you know, I've always been a country boy, so to speak. So Totori fits my character quite well. Have you, know? you always, always been kind of, because a lot of your projects and your business, your tourism, everything mm. is real sustainable focus or doing what we can to help the environment. Uh, do you remember when you started getting interested in that? Can you... Uh, the the travel side of things or the nature side of things, which which either. So I mean, uh, growing up in a small village in the countryside, um, my first love was butterflies. Actually, we had a butterf uh, a what was it? A what's the tree I'm thinking of? Anyway, a tree that attracts butterflies in the front garden. So I got to learn about those, and then I moved on to birds. So I've always been interested in um, nature and it was my dream from a young age to be a safari guide, actually. And um, back in 2010 or nine, was it? I um, actually trained to be a safari guide, got my license and kind of ticked that box before realizing um, that it's not really, it's a difficult way to make a living doing that in Africa so but that you know f fed into I, I traveled a lot and always want always tried to travel to kind of adventurous places and see the countryside and see the animals so that kind of led to me getting more of an understanding about a sustainable travel and low impact travel and um, kind of a way that travel can help support wildlife in the places you visit so that's something i've always been interested in and, and something i'm doing these days myself as much as possible wow that's it's great and you've just started this really interesting nonprofit, a sustainable dyson kit let's start with that because that's a major new project uh, how did that start tell us a bit about it yeah, and it's certainly become a major project. It wasn't the um, the overall that the the, um, the main aim wasn't to be this huge NPO in the beginning. Uh, basically, I started doing um, Japanese giant salamander um, kind of conservation experiences back in two thousand and eighteen. I think it was with Dr. Okada, who's the leading expert in the world about salamanders, Japanese giant salamanders, I should say. And we welcome lots of people uh, from the US especially who would come to Japan specifically to come and do our experience, specifically to tick their, you know, bucket list animal, Japanese giant salamander, and see that in the wild. And due to that, then I also found out that where my where I'm speaking from now um Mikuria uh, in Daisen town so on the north 
space of Mount Dyson. It's a really important and a very unique environment um, habitat for Japanese giant salamanders because um, uh, because of the kind of unique geographical features and uh, historical and cultural aspects of Mount Dyson, it means that the Japanese giant salamanders breed in this area, which is relatively close to the ocean. So it's the only place in the world with a, a breeding population of Japanese giant salamanders so close to the ocean. But what what that also means is that it's in amongst people. And be, where there's people, there's trouble for wildlife generally. So because of that, um, we I, I, I became aware of the, the need for urgent action. Um, if you stop on that photograph, if you go mm -hmm. back, you can. So just behind there, you can see um, weirds, so like concrete like not dams exactly, but artificial barriers in the river. And the 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 Nawa River um basin here has been highly um well damaged, I guess you could say. Um so lots of these artificial barriers have been installed in the river which stops the movement of the salamanders. So the uh, the initial goal was just to do a, a a campaign to push for the the government to put artificial ramps so that the the um, salamanders could move up and down to breed and to find food and to find shelter. Um, but then it kind of we discussed it and it basically it was decided that in order to reach out to Japanese people, we need something quite official, and therefore we created this non-profit organization called Sustainable Dyson. Sorry, that was a very long-winded. No, no, very about. important. But um, then, yeah. Yeah, and there's there's other, a lot of different things that you're doing as a part of that. Uh, there's other organizations around the world, of course, um, having similar trouble when the rivers are dammed. Uh, how do salmon get mm, upstream, for right. example? Um, lots of innovative ideas i i saw at one point you were picking them up and carrying them to another area um no no, <laughs> okay. no. that might that might have been someone else with salamanders when i yeah, was reading you about shouldn't, you guys. shouldn't do that um you, well the thing about japanese giant salamanders is, is that they're uh, considered an, a national treasure a national monument um and they've been protected in japan since 1952 which means that only licensed researchers can legally touch them, right? So people, you can't just go to the river and lift them up the, up the weir. But what this, so it means, so the protection is there. So basically they were being eaten out of existence back then. Um, but the problem isn't just that. The problem is that the, the rivers in which they live are being altered hugely so if you concrete around them you concrete up the riverside you make the rivers straighter and basically destroy the home of the salamanders then it doesn't matter if you can't touch them because they're gonna die anyway right so this is something it's like for, for many people oh it's a special it's a national monument which you know they're being taken care of but they're really not and that's basically something we wanted to address and make people aware of that because no they're not fine just because they're protected really really they're not fine and there's a real chance that they're going to die out in the next 20 years if action isn't taken over the next three four five years um and then something is brought up here is you got salamanders in the middle of that picture so it's not about just protecting the animals it's protecting our our whole thing is that we, you need to protect the whole environment in which um, the salamanders live. Uh, so we have forest projects because there's, um, so we can see Dyson forest rewilding because Japanese forests have big problems because they're um, something like 44% of the forests in Japan are artificial. And we could talk for hours about that 
as well if you want. Um, <laughs> but so we're, well, doing, we're, we're, we're doing that project. Let's just, let's just okay. mention there that you're doing a lot of fantastic collaborations with um, so, for example, with the giant salamanders, you're working with an amazing researcher, mm. uh, Dr. Sumio Okada, and uh, doing yeah. making sure that the salamanders are really well taken care of. For the rewilding, it sounds like you're working with Totori University professors. Is that right? Yeah, so Totori Environmental University. Um, so we're actually working with them in regards to all of our projects, actually. Um, so we have forest projects. We ha so basically, um, for those who can read the kanji in the middle there, you've got forest, river, town, and hatake. What's that? Fields, I guess you could say, farming. Um, so our projects, yeah. So it's you need to to take care of the forests in order to take care of the salamanders. Obviously, you need to take care of the river. So the town part is basically education. We need to, to tell people in the villages and towns about the, the, the truth and the situation, on, you know, as it is now. And also um, clean water, chemical free water is very important for amphibians overall. So we're looking at um, doing organic farming projects and also supporting the organic farming movement in this area and beyond. And so yes, we're 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 seeking um, expert advice for for each part that we do, each project area. And in regards for Okada Sensei, so he's the 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 world's leading authority, but he's actually so he's very busy man, as you might imagine. So he's not exactly he's not he's not hands on involved in this project. It was because of him that I set this up. He mentioned the, the, his desire for local people to do something. I'm not exactly local, but I live here, if you know what I mean. I'm, I'm new local. So um, we are reaching out to local people and getting them and finding a way to get them involved. That, that's been key, actually, um, because... Our talks with local people have shown that they've been honest and said, well, you know, for them, the salamanders aren't anything particularly special because they've seen them in the rivers growing up. But what is important to them is the water quality for their farms, for their rice fields. So they, one of our big um, mission is to test the water quality. And we all know there are certain issues and we all know what's causing that. Um, and so th th their angle is, if you can do the water testing and prove that something needs doing about the water quality, then we will support you with the salamander project. So that's, so it's okay, it's involving local people, kind of almost indirectly, but whatever works really. If yeah. we get their support, we get their support. And you're, you're doing projects with students, so you've got the education side of it, uh, in yes. terms of rewilding or... Uh, yeah. seeing about the salamander's life so you're yeah. also working with businesses because you're trying to encourage organic farming and uh, yeah. more sustainable practices there is a lot involved mm -hmm. in yes. what you're doing it's amazing it's yeah it's it's become a bit of a a, a river monster itself to be honest but in, in a in a in a fun way but you know my my um, my wife is Japanese and she's taken on. Um, she had no experience of setting these, you know, an MPO up or doing these kind of things, but she's done it and she's been amazing. So a big thank you to her if she's listening. So, um, but those the pictures you showed there actually they were high school kids from Tokyo. So sustainable, uh, yeah, SDG tours for schools coming in from. Osaka and Tokyo is is another angle um, that we we we're, we're pursuing and already moving, obviously because you can see them. So that's actually in my own field there. We we, we um, planted some potatoes, and it's just on the edge of there. We're going to do the forest rewilding. So just on the edge there, we also planted the first trees. Nice. Yeah. So that's definitely so. The education part is not just for the, the youth of Totori. We want to kind of spread the message across Japan and, you know, and 
just to get people to think about you know everything they buy has a cost that's not just the one that's you know the monetary cost and just to yeah yeah. i think that's really smart and like you're doing with tourism Mm. uh introducing it to the inbound market who come to totori as well yes Uh, doing sdg tours for tokyo students as well as local students um, the more, the wider reach that you can have, the better effect you're going to have, I would imagine. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, that's the plan. It's just to, you know, spread the word and, and get people thinking and yeah, put Tutori on the map in a good way and have it kind of the image be of nature and, and, and cause that's what we've got, right? It's the smallest population in Japan. And instead of being a kind of bad, negative point or even a, it's a sort, kind of almost like a source of shame for some people, I feel, in Sotori. They feel a bit, you know, and a bit of a laughed at by people from Tokyo. But for me, about, it's like, who, but we have. Salamanders? Not the salamanders, just about life in Sotori and being a kind of backwater. But I um, want to kind of, I, I think it should be something to be proud of. Like, yeah. Who, who, Who's the smart ones, really? Who we get to live with clean air, and we all have our own field, and you know what I mean. We're not yeah, paying definitely. In paying. the, I think in the next five years, mm. uh, people in the cities are going to start to really be jealous of people living in the rural areas that yeah. are are cleaner and closer to nature and closer to resources that you need for a high quality life, right? Yes. Yeah, I think so. I mean, what if that's the case, anyone thinking about that, now is the time to come to, 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 well, the next 10 years, it's going to empty out for sure, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's already pretty empty, but it's going to get, it's going, it's going to be emptier. And, and yeah. Um, now you did, you had a very exciting plug from an international YouTuber who oh, yeah. really helped shine a light on the salamanders of Totori. And yes. especially focus on your tours with Bushido Japan mm. and your collaboration with Dr. Okada. Yes. Uh, how did that happen? That's a very exciting collaboration. Yeah, so Brave Wilderness have been really great since the beginning of this whole plan, really. And I, I've spoken to them even this week about various things. Um, well, basically because we're, we're, well, we as in, me i guess my company is the only um english english speaking um japanese giant salamander experience uh provider if that makes sense so even if if you search for any information in english about japanese giant salamanders until i I, i'm obviously biased but until we put our website up the information out there was terrible, right? Really, and it's like, and actually, almost shameful. Some of the reporting and what people were doing, and videos on YouTube of being, you know, manhandling, really rough with them, and that kind of stuff. So one of our big aims was to put correct and detailed information about salamanders. So basically, anyway, so they they wanted to come to Japan and they wanted to film the Japanese giant salamanders. So simply they Googled it and my company came up in the, in English language. And then we started talks and we've been um, working together ever since. Yeah, that's, uh, it, yeah. that's absolutely incredible. Um, so in, in your research, uh, when you go out with your tours, mm. it looks like um, you're... Okara-san is the only one handling the giant mm. salamanders usually, um, mm. but the guests can help with the measuring and really learn how to spot them in the water and yeah. other interesting points of of finding them. I, they're incredible creatures. They they are. I mean, they're they're really a special animal in the world, and so they haven't changed pretty much for twenty three million years. They're considered a living dinosaur. And even though, I mean, like I said, I, I, I trained as a safari guide. I've, I've traveled the world looking for rare animals. And I lived in Totori, and I didn't ever think I'd have a chance to um, 
ever see one in the world to be honest just like for they're too elusive and you have to know where to look um so yeah so basically we we give that opportunity and then genuinely when the guests come the data collected is is really useful for conservation purposes so yeah that's really uh, we have a we have a comment from brad pearson on facebook don't eat the manders we love them yeah i, yeah. I won't don't worry <laughs> actually i'm vegetarian anyway these days so definitely <laughs> <laughs> what do they have predators i was gonna ask you that uh just sometimes they eat each other it yeah like i mean pretty much a salamander will eat anything that swims past his mouth that they that they think that they can get in there and um like you know snakes that are way bigger than them they'll sometimes swallow but yeah they don't uh, they don't have any um natural predators in the wild here when when they're smaller then yes other larger salamanders will eat them just because it's meat like object near its mouth is not something they they don't actively hunt them but it it looks like their mouth is just jaws it doesn't look like they have teeth they do that. they they have two rows of very sharp teeth and but they they do the the death roll spin thing as well but so they're very very jagged yeah very sharp teeth um but they're they're really really gentle giants um so yeah i mean okada sensei's shown me a picture of, of his finger that's been cut cut up once but he's handled salamanders thousands of times and nothing happens really um but in turn, you no, know, they they basically don't have any natural predators in Japan. The biggest problem is obviously, like most places, humans. Yes. But and at least, at least in theory, as well. Yes. Right? Yeah. So like, so they were yeah, eaten a lot, as Brad Pearson San is pointing out. But pretty much, as far as I'm aware, anyway, since 1952, when they were it became protected as a national treasure, that has largely um, that problem is largely fixed. It might still go on in small scale. I've heard that a little bit, but that's not really a conservation issue these days. Unlike, for example, Chinese giant salamanders and who have been almost eaten out of existence in the wild, but there's, you know, f farmed. They're farmed in other parts of the world specifically for meat. Mm. Wow, well, I didn't, I didn't realize they were eaten, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about Bushido Japan okay. and Yamabushi. Mm. I talked to Tim Bunting, uh, who's a Yamabushi uh, guide and Yamabushi Insider in the Tohoku area. Uh, are you doing Yamabushi tours or anything, or is it just a personal thing for you? Yeah, it's, I don't exactly do Yamabushi tours, although recently I've done more um, like waterfall training with the priests at Mitoku-san. So basically my Yamabushi connection, if that's what, I can call it came about because I became good friends with the head priest's son, who's also a priest at Mitoku-san. So Mitoku-san is a um, very important Shugendo. So Yamabushi are Gyoja, which are trainees of Shugendo, which is a kind of, how would you define Shugendo? Um, a mixture, a blend of Shinto, Buddhism, and asceticism, mountain worship, that dates back to year, well, the, let me work this out, the 7th century Japan. And the founder of um, Shugendo was Enno Gyoja. And he was said to have thrown three lotus um, blossoms, petals, whichever one, up into the air and instructed them to land at the three most sacred Shugendo sites. And basically one of those was Mitokusa. So it's basically, it's considered one of the three most sacred sites. So I became friends with the guy who's 
also wearing the white robe in the picture with me there. Um, and I've, because of our friendship and my kind of support of Mitoku-san as a place for people to visit, especially inbound, I've been invited over the years to join uh, the ceremonies, the official ceremonies. So, for example, in this picture and that one was last year. It was, um, that's the real deal. That was not cosplay or something. It was actual, the actual ceremony. And if you look, so that, that temple there behind me was, it's at least a thousand years old, this structure itself, but it dates back to the year 733. And it's deep in the mountain and you walk along a course there. Um, so yeah, so basically my love of Mitoku-san has, and my friendship with the priests has led to me getting involved in kind of Yamabushi mountain priest activities. But then I've also been kind of connected with other Shugendo groups, and there's one um, in, in Wani, Wani Ontake group, and I've done pilgrimages on Ontake with them with Jan, I think Jan might be listening, Jan Williams, you should interview her, I think, if you haven't already, she's a professor that um, is an expert in all these kind of things, and um, yeah, and then the more I've got, you know, looked into the beliefs and, and tried to practice them myself, then I can definitely see the connection of, of how... Um, you need to look at the mountains are a gift from the gods and you need to take care of them in order to live healthily beneath them which sort of ties in everything into sustainable dyson's kind of goals and where you you know you need to look after the whole mountain environment in order for us to live healthily in the valleys and villages below definitely does yeah. this connect this spiritual side of it does it connect to your tours in bhutan as well uh indirectly um i think bhutan that so basically but the bhutan story is that basically uh, many of my customers coming to japan to japan often said that bhutan was on their bucket list of countries to go to and i didn't know much about bhutan myself so i just went there and i um got into talks with a uh, an agent there and basically decided let's you know i I'm, I'm sure i can bring customers how about we just make put a tour together and then since then our relationship has grown and i've taken multiple groups there really but bhutan is the ultimate sustainable sdgs um country really high quality over quantity tourism uh 60 percent 65 percent of the country is forested more than half is national parks they banned plastic bags like 15 20 years ago or something and every tourist it's because it's high end every you know there's it's sort of almost like uh well I, a lot of the money that you you spend visiting goes into community projects so healthcare is free for all bhutanese people education is free and that's a lot of mostly paid for by tourism so it's if you want yeah uh, somewhere that's um the ultimate environmental environmentally aware and friendly country then bhutan's that well, you know, even going through some places in Japan, for example, we were passing through Kurashiki in Okayama, and the government has invested money in protecting the heritage historical area. And in the morning before the tourists came, I mm -hmm. went out and all the locals were enjoying it. And they love that area and they love how it's been preserved. And they're so welcoming to me. Mm -hmm. So when you take care of local people, it is better not only for local people it's better for tourism for the absolutely. long term that's right? right yeah absolutely it's it's everything is connected and if if you remove that connection then it just 
starts to fall apart, which was a little bit of what we were seeing before COVID with the kind of unsustainable travel that Japan was engaged in and hopefully have learned lessons from. So can you think of any strategies that you see in Bhutan in place? Um, that might work in Japan in terms of how tourism can fund projects which improve the life of locals? Big question. Yeah, that is a big question. But, I mean, it, it, I think that it, if, the, if there was more of a shift towards quality over quantity, then that can only be beneficial, I would think. Um yeah, that's a that's a big question. But I mean, there's so many similarities between Bhutan in, in, and Japan, really, because Bhutan was an isolated country, and you know, no foreigners were allowed in until actually right up until like the 1950s. So, and Japan obviously has a history of that. Um, you know, quite the mountains, spiritual mountains, and mountain worshiping religions. Um, and in many cases, the Japanese and the Bhutanese look very similar as well, actually. It's quite interesting how that happens. And there are some relationships between Japan and Bhutan now, but yeah, I think, yeah, I'm not really quite sure off the top of my head how those projects can be implemented other than stop just trying to get as many people in the door as possible and, and think more carefully about um you know how you can make the experience more enjoyable for both the host and the guest absolutely and i think as we go forward uh thinking more about what does the local people need and let's try to use some of the tourism money to make sure the locals know that mm. this is from tourism and it's benefiting them. So there's yes. an element of education, awareness, transparency, yes. which I think really helps with the welcoming feeling. Mm. Um, because if we're going back to status quo, just thinking about numbers, the locals who are now very stressed and having trouble, you know, everybody's kind of having trouble with business and, uh, you know, nobody's really doing that well. Mm. So if tourism starts coming in by numbers instead of people who really appreciate what they're seeing and doing, yeah. uh, we're going to have a lot of friction, right? I, I think so. I think so. And I think that the... The, the overall strategy of the Japanese government to push the same kind of programs is part of the problem. And um, there's a lot of lip service paid to promoting um, tourism in less famous spots, such as Totori or Shimane. Um, but there doesn't seem to be much real action. It seems to be a lot of talk only. So I think that needs to change and there actually needs to be genuine um, programs put in place. They're actually kind of, um, the results need to be judged too. Don't just say, let's do it and then, you know, make something and go, okay, we've done it now. That's, that's fine. No, you need to, is it working? If it's not working properly, how can we make it better and then implement those changes? So that kind of, thinking from the beginning all the way through needs to improve for sure absolutely um, but i have no idea how you're going to change that really that's kind of a <laughs> deep cultural issue perhaps but something i think is going to have to be worked out to yeah. be honest but i i think making the targets mm. setting things in motion assessing <laughs> along the way uh, using yeah. the best possible option reassessing Exactly. New targets, you know, yes. these are all usual yes. long-term strategies for success that we hope yes. will happen. <laughs> yes, we hope, but <laughs> that we always we, we, yes. We, we will see. Yes, indeed. Um, let's talk about some of the other amazing tourism assets that you have in Totori, which you are also introducing to people. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like you do a lot of cycling tours. Yes, so I actually started doing cycling tours for when I worked for Inside Japan Tours as a tour leader and I used to do their cycling tours around the Noto Peninsula 
so that's how I kind of I wasn't I've always been fit and into sport so I wasn't much of a cyclist before doing those but that really opened my eyes and that made me realize the potential for the Sanin region which is the Sanin region it's Shimane and Totori basically um yeah what what an amazing area um this is for cycling um you know many many countryside roads without basically any traffic on at all amazing you got views of both the mountains and the oceans you can go across and take the ferry over to yoki islands which is like a almost perfect uh, like cycling paradise really because it's you know it's not just about the flat the climbs and the the downhills are all part of the the joy as well so i, I started running tours through the sun in or by bike about i'm not sure now for five years ago something like that and already we've had guests from sweden australia america canada france uh and a few more which i've forgotten but but really it's yeah you know few people slow life that this is the, for me that that's the perfect ingredients for a cycling destination and also for me it's the, like I, as I don't want to be where there's thousands of other cyclists everywhere as well do you know what I mean which is getting the case now because kind of almost the over promotion of specific cycling routes in Japan I mean that's my opinion that's not you know that's all it is but uh, I'd rather cycle and be kind of just our group amongst the villages, not, you know, bumping elbows with other cyclists the whole time. But yeah, so I'm actually working on a new tour, which is going to, uh, I've already got customers booked in, repeat customers, but it's kind of like a, a super extreme version of what I've done before with daily climbs of more than 2000 meters some days we cycle like 130 kilometers so really going deep into the mountains but the, but my kind of new angle on it is like okay if you're really a fit cyclist and want a, an epic kind of hard tour this is for you but if you're if you want to see those areas but you're not so kind of hardcore then there's the option to use electrically assisted bikes because generally until now, my feeling is that in Japan, like the view of electrically assisted cycling is like for people that don't like cycling, who are not fit. And maybe that's the case if that's the only option that is on offer. But I think if you use them to to lift. So if your level is kind of intermediate by using a, a kind of electrically assisted bike, then you can go up to a kind of advanced level or whatever you want to call it tough level tour and then you get to see a completely different side of japan where you know where if you get deep in the mountains here the, the view the energy the wildlife is just really epic so i that's why i've considered it the japan's most epic tour so the yeah, first tour is great yeah so if you want to join <laughs> <laughs> I, I will suggest it to okay. lots of my cyclist friends. Yes. Okay. Great. So like I said, so I'm working on that. There was literally booking hotels for that this morning. So um, it will be on my website within a few, within a week, hopefully. And then it's due to run early November, which is the best time for um, autumn color in this region so yeah that sounds amazing yeah and it, it sounds like you've done a similar thing in terms of the hiking courses as well um mm. you you offer a range of hiking yeah days yes. uh from beginners to quite extreme people mm. who want to really go for it who are at a really high fitness level is that right yeah so that that's basically in um here at on mount dyson so mount that many people come by themselves to mount dyson and they do what's the standard route which is called the natsuyama course and to be honest like you, know, you don't necessarily need a guide to do that of course by hiring a guide you can get extra value and learn um different things that you wouldn't know 
uh, if you did it yourself. But the Dyson has so many other routes, which unless you live here, and um, for me, it was about going out with the local old guys who've been hiking for the last 50 years and learning the courses. Then it's really basically almost impossible to do some of the more um, advanced courses, which are about eight to 10 hours long with several peaks so dyson is actually a, not one peak it's a series of peaks so you've got those there at the top of that picture but then off to the left hand side is another another kind of um line of peaks as well so it's going off basically several mountains in one day but all within the dyson area and like that you know along ridges and stuff like that so you don't need to be you don't need any specialist equipment. You just need to know the route. So like here is that's called Godzilla's backbone. And that's really um an adventurous part of the of of that particular hike. And then of course as you're showing there, um winter in Dyson is really special as well. So even though so Dyson is a mountain that's seven hundred and something meters high. But because of its position right next to the Sea of Japan, in winter it has the weather conditions of a mountain that's more than 3,000 meters high. So that's quite extreme. So it gets thick snow and once you get to a certain point, it's like you, you're entering another planet. It's really crazy. So I do offer those tours as well in winter, along with snowshoeing at slightly lower levels. But basically, yeah, I've got you know, if you want to come to Dyson and have fun, whatever the level, whatever that fitness level or adventure level, whatever you have, then I've probably got something for you. That's awesome. It is amazing. Yeah. And it's a great way for you to keep fit. As yeah. Well. Yeah, um, absolutely. Do, you, do you have staff or are you doing everything? Mostly I do everything. Um, I might have to think about that moving forward as I'm busy with the MPO stuff. But yeah, I, mostly I do that. If I have cycling, then I employ support staff. And for like my cycling tours, if they're sort of 10 days or two weeks, then I have, you know, a support van driver and, and usually a support cyclist as well. But if it's day, uh, Dyson day hikes and things like that, it's basically me. So an interesting quick point about Dyson and why a guide is good for these courses is because they used to sell a map, um, quite detailed map, quite, and you used to be able to get it quite easily. But because they didn't want to maintain the routes and the signs specifically, and they stopped selling the, the maps. So like if we don't provide the maps, then people won't go there. I'm like, well, <laughs> I don't know about that, but just okay so that's why i've managed to get one of these maps and it's in one of my prized possessions and uh and even if you have the map it's still hard to know where it is unless you go there so that's the importance like i said i, I go out hiking with 75 year old you know mountain guys that you know that i met in the um in the onsen and uh and that's the best way to learn all the local knowledge. So then I've so I've spent years gaining that knowledge and then I can pass that on to my guests. That's a really important tip. I would say it's great to get a guide uh, anywhere in Japan uh, because there's always things that the guides can introduce you to that you cannot get from uh, online resource or a guidebook. They yeah. just, they know the area, they know the people mm -hmm. and uh, what you're saying about hiking and cycling, um, snow sports, snowshoeing, a lot of the things you do as well, definitely want insider knowledge for yes. sure. Yeah, I, I think so. It's, it's about value, right? So you, it, you, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of places you don't need a guide and you can do it yourself. And sure, if that's your, that's your thing, then no problem. But if you spend money, big amount of money to get there, why not spend a bit more and get more, you know, deeper understanding and and ultimately a lot more enjoyment from your time there. So that's, you know, that's the value of us guides. Absolutely. Yeah. 
uh, you spent all the money and time and effort to get there. And uh, mm. have you ever like visited somewhere? I mean, you didn't plan ahead. You just kind of ended up somewhere. You walk around and you're like, this is nice. And then you meet somebody later and they're like, oh, did you see such and such? That's really good there. And you're like, what? I yeah. know it, right? So you yeah. don't want to have that happen for like your trip of a lifetime when you right. come to this area. Right? right. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah, I mean, yeah. And especially if you're, if you know, obviously if you're traveling alone, then it's more. But if you're in a small group and everyone pays a little bit, then that's even, that's the best way to do it if you can do it like that. Yeah. I want to talk about the salamanders again. Um, sure. But I want, before we go back to the salamanders, mm. uh, tell us about your guest house because I was just at the Minka Summit. So mm. everybody's all excited about remodeling these old houses that have been abandoned. And uh, your guest house looks really cute. Yeah, it's um, it's called Richiado, which is obviously a, pay, a play on my name, Richard. So in Japanese, it's Richiado. And um, yeah, it was never my dream to be an innkeeper, you know, Basil Fawlty and all that kind of stuff. If you're English, you get all those comparisons, if you know what that who that is. Um, but basically a... How do you call it? Machi Sukuri, like a local town development group, knew that I was um, experienced in bringing inbound customers to this area. And one of the ideas they had to kind of re um, regenerate and put new energy into this fishing village here at the bottom of Dyson was to open a guest house which would attract foreigners to stay. So they actually asked me if I would start a guest house here. And that was on um, in there were certain local and regional government grants available, which they organized to pay for the renovations, basically. So, yeah, I put I ended up putting some of my own money into it just to get it up to the level that I was happy with. But to be honest, a lot of it came through government programs, and one of the one of the financial um, packages, if you want to call it that, grants was young people's um, project money. And I was thirty nine at the time, which I found quite funny. But thirty nine around here is you know wet behind the ears. So yeah, I enjoyed being a young person for a while there. I noticed that, you know, that a lot of the government grants, they'll say uh, under 40s. Like this is partly focused on supporting entrepreneurs mm -hmm. under 40. And you're like, hey, I've got like 30 more years of career left at my age. <laughs> What's up with we under 40s? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To be honest, I, I didn't even realize that I only just sneaked in under the, under the I'm level. I'm glad there. you got but, it. It's a beautiful, yeah. it's a beautiful remodel. I thought you did a great job. Um, yeah. I, I love the Rama, the old style across the top, the wooden beam. And yeah. yeah, it's a nice combination yeah. of modern comfort and classic style. Yes, that's right. I mean, yeah. So we have quite, you know, Japanese kitchens are not the best part of Japanese culture in, in my experience. So it's, we've basically kind of got a Western uh, kitchen with a huge stove from it's actually that i've got a, a slightly newer one now but you can see that's like a a normal american or british style cooker as we would say so it's great for cooking for you know groups of 10 people or whatever so and the countertops are at a height which is more foreigner friendly if you know what i'm saying but then the bedrooms are you know tatami so it's yeah it's definitely a blend of the better points of western and japanese accommodation that well that was the the plan and pre pre covid we were yeah pretty busy especially for hong kong um inbound guests we used to get regularly get groups of 10 to 15 people come and stay for five six days so that they were that was really great but obviously that's completely dried up at the moment but we'll see what happens with that in the future 
Yeah, because I was going to say, you know, you're doing like the the usual recommendation for if you're going to live in the rural areas, um, you're you've got a diverse income stream from different different oh, jobs. It's really, but that's so important. Unfortunately, they're all in tourism and they were all hit hard during coronavirus. But mm. hopefully that helps uh, a bit more security monthly, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that being diverse is important, but also the overheads are low here, right? So that was key. And um, I, I used to have a lot of um, work away, as I don't know if you've come across this program. There's a website called workaway.info, and it's similar to woofing, where people well, it can be Japanese people as well but mostly it's foreigners come and, and they want to work for a month or something like that and you give them accommodation into in exchange for work and also some some money as well so that that and that you know keeps everything m more interesting finding like regular part-time staff around here for just Japanese people is is quite difficult actually right. yeah but, everybody's feeling the labor crunch. And I think we'll see that when tourism resumes, we're yes. going to see yes. a lot more lobbies without staff, like people having to check in only computerized, right? For sure. Um, I, they I, just don't have really. the staff. Yeah. And it's going to, yeah, especially the first six months or so, I think is going to be the um, demand is going to be outstripping the supply, but they'll probably still try and do it anyway because they need the money, right? So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what, what things are created to get around that problem. Yeah. A uh, quick question from well, YouTube, from Frass. Uh, where yeah. did you get the cooker in Japan? So, um, no, it was imported from America. So, I, I yeah, I... I the, the the guy that did the renovation, the carpenter of this house, is actually an American guy that's lived in Japan about 35 years. So he often imports this and that. So that's the good way to do that. Nice. Mm. A great comment from the Kiwi Yamabushi. As a fellow practitioner of Shugendo, I'd love to connect. Hey, yeah, well, please, um, you know, click on my social media links and connect up awesome uh let's go back uh we've got about eight more minutes and end on the salamander and the sustainable dyson organization Fantastic. um how can people get involved how can they support what you're doing um is there anything you would recommend to anybody else thinking about starting a similar kind of conservation organization Any okay advice? so first of all if if you go to our website, which is www.sustainabledyson.org, then, yeah, there's lots of information about who we are, about, and like I said, we tried to make it, actually not we tried, we have made it the best resource in English about Japanese giant salamanders anywhere on the internet. But also there's a page there that says support us. So if you go there, then I've outlined, you know, how to, you know, obviously we're an NPO, so donations are important to us, but also um, subscribe to our mailing lists and join our social media. And to be honest, if you have other ideas about how you can help, I'm definitely interested in that because this, a big part of, of how this project got off the ground was I reached out to, ALTs around Japan via the AJET web, uh, Facebook groups and made what's called the Salamander. Well, first I called it the Salamander Army, but then Japanese people found that a bit threatening, so I changed it to Salamander Defenders. So, right, so you've got these guys who are all ex jets um, in Japan with various different skill sets who have been amazing at, at you know, shooting the video writing some of the articles on the website and you know coming here and like brad there researching the salamanders so if you want to get involved in other ways then please contact me if you want to do your own projects that raise money and or, or and or awareness for what we're doing please you know let me know um in terms of starting an npo um 
the, my best advice is to marry a Japanese person because <laughs> it's r ridiculously complicated. And my wife was, has been an absolute legend, and and she's really amazed me. I knew she was smart, but you know, just her the 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 dedication it took to get it over the line was just incredible. So, but it is possible. We did it. That both of us have no experience of working for, or certainly not starting in an NPO. So. Just patience. Uh, the J Japan has um, like you know NPO support offices in pretty much every town. It seems so. You definitely need to or should go and and contact with them. Almost definitely, they won't speak English though, so that's definitely a barrier if if you're not fluent. So definitely, partnering with someone Japanese would be. A good way to go. Yeah, and you you've got a lot of collaborations with universities as well. Um, that seems like a really good way to go. Have you found that really useful? It's, it's having the students it's, and the professors. Yeah, to be honest, the, especially the last few weeks when already we've made this connection with so, um, if with Totori Environmental University, our projects have moved forward at. at, at you know, at speeds we couldn't, we hadn't dreamed of before. So they've been absolutely incredible. So if there's an environment, if you want to do something with the environment, if you can connect with an environmental university, well, if our interactions are anything to go with, then um, that that they yeah, it's incredible. It's definitely the change. It's been a game changer. And even this morning, talking about, you know, the ramp situation, I reached out to them and said, you know, this, this uh, just a couple of days ago, I was in the river and it's on my Facebook and in our Facebook, I posted about it. But we saw 11 huge um, uh, ja Japanese giant salamanders, 10 of which were banging their heads up against the concrete weirs trying to move up the river, which they couldn't. So it's you know extremely bittersweet um, situation where it's great to see them, but you know it's terrible. But with that, well, anyway, my point was that. So I just spoke very directly and clearly with them. It's like you know we need to do something. Urgency is important. So we're developing a plan right now about how we can move it forward quickly until a more permanent kind of government situation government fixes is is, is um, implemented so yes the environmental university and I've I've spoken to a few other lecturers around Japan as well and that's been useful and uh, having filmmakers uh, people can who can get the good quality pictures and videos out like mm. this video uh, which I just shared the link for is absolutely beautiful right yeah is this your volunteer team or yes. did you have a professional team no to this, this this was volunteer team so this is amazing so I reached out to the you know because that's the thing ALTs are the, I think the ultimate human resource right because all of them have got a, a degree, at least a degree, often a master's degree in something. N normally, not English teaching as well, right? And a lot of um, they have passion for the country that the for Japan because they're here, and also they have time because <laughs> the ALTs are not you know don't always have the busiest schedule. So you know they they, they were <laughs> been absolutely amazing. So that was definitely the best decision I've made out of the whole project I think is to get them involved and uh, so wonderful yeah and even that there's um you can see the, and the team um yeah Rachel for example is is um she has experience of working um as an working for a non-profit before coming to Japan so you've got all these different experiences you know at different people with different life experiences which can add something so reach out reach out to the ALTs and, and other foreigners in in Japan and see if if they want to 
get involved. Good advice. Thank you so much, Richard. Keep up the good thank, work. You do an amazing stuff. Thank you so much. I will, uh, I will be doing my best. <laughs> I, I look forward to coming and visiting please you. Do, um, please do. Please do. Not too far. It's about two hours over the mountains from Hiroshima. Yeah, so two hours. Is, is, yeah, you can cycle that. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta get my electric bike Exactly. Out. Yeah. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you. That was awesome. Enjoy. Thank you. Have a nice evening and, and speak to you again soon. Yeah. Okay. Stay in touch. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We had some great questions and comments today. Uh, definitely uh, follow the links and uh, reach out to Richard and do one of his tours, support his uh, sustainable Dyson organization and save the giant salamanders, but not only the salamanders, the whole area. Um, thank you so much for watching and uh, join us again tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Take care, everyone. Bye.